Luke 9 23 said let him deny himself what does it mean to say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ a lot of us stop at the cross stop with John 3 16 because we don't truly understand how big the cross is as you all know we've currently been in a series going through the book of Romans and we're going to look at uh, the book of Romans from the beginning all the way through the end. And um, this book, or it's actually, it's actually an epistle, which means nothing more than it's a letter, was meant to be from Paul to the church in Rome. And Rome, of course, being the capital of the Roman Empire, this church had likely been started by some folks who were present at the events of Pentecost and Acts. Paul, of course, was the author. He, was, he would have been around the same age as Jesus. He was born around the same time in a place called Tarsus. And back then he was known as Saul before his conversion uh, on the uh, road to Damascus. Tarsus, of course, is located in modern-day Turkey, which today is an Islamic country. But many, many years ago, it was one of the most Christian places in all the world when it was known as the Byzantine Empire. He was extremely smart, educated, and he was religious. He was from the strictest sect of Jewish society called the Pharisees. And another point of interest, as I've told you before, is that Paul was a Roman citizen. So Paul was, and that's going to play a major piece in the two verses we're going to look at today him being a Roman citizen and what that means as far as his gifts that God has given him and the people that he can minister to. It's an important point. And of course, the purpose of this letter was for him to tell them that he was coming to Rome. He had been planning for a long time, but it hadn't worked out until the present. He was coming to Rome. He was going to impart some spiritual advice on them, some good, solid Christian theology. So that's what this is. Now, if you would, flip open to Romans chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. That's all we're going to look at today. Romans 1 and verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you're able as we read from God's holy, perfect, sufficient, and inerrant <laughs> word this morning. Romans 1, 16 and 17. The Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness for in it, sorry, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessed word this morning. We ask that you would take it, that you would help us to discern it, and that you would help us to apply it to our lives. God, I pray especially if there's one here who does not know you as Lord and Savior, that you would take these words, that you would apply them to their life, that you would have the Holy Spirit work on them and help them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as they would just understand their need for him. We pray all these things as you work through me, as I'm your mouthpiece this morning, and they, they not listen to me, they listen to you. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. <clears throat> now, there's three things that we're going to focus on this morning from God's Word that Paul reveals to us in these two verses of Scripture. Number one, there's an eagerness to share the gospel. There's an eagerness to share the gospel. Number two deals with sharing our faith and how that works. Sharing our faith. So one and two sound very similar, but they are just a little bit distinct. Number one, eagerness to share the gospel. Number two, sharing our faith. And number three, salvation by faith alone. Salvation by faith alone. I didn't have to make up that one. That one was already there. So I can't wait to get to that one. That's an easy, easy, easy one to preach. God has laid it out and Paul has laid it out so clearly. So we're going to work through these one at a time. The first one is eagerness 
to share the gospel. <clears throat> now Paul says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew and also for the Greek. Now, what we have to realize at this point is that Paul has already been through a lot. Paul has already been through a lot. If anybody had a reason to be afraid of what might happen to them if they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was Paul. Paul had reason to be afraid of what would happen to him. We, our little complaints here and there, there have nothing to complain about compared to what Paul had experienced by the time he writes this letter to the church in Rome. For example, Paul had been put in prison when he was in Philippi. You want to back that up? Check Acts chapter 16. He had been chased out of Thessalonica if you look back at Acts chapter 17 and verse 10. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 14, he had to be smuggled out of Berea. How would you like that to be said of you? That you had to be smuggled out of a place because they wanted to kill you. He had been laughed at and mocked in Athens. You check Acts chapter 17 and verse 32. He was called a fool by those in Corinth. If you check 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 18. He had even been stoned in Galatia. If you check Acts 14 and verse 19. He goes on to be shipwrecked and all kinds of things. Paul had been through it all. You can put that on a t-shirt, probably. Paul had really been through it all. Ladies and gentlemen, tell me again how bad your week was, amen? It wasn't quite as bad as Paul's. This man had really been through it. But, that's not the point. The point is, he is still eager to present the gospel of Jesus Christ despite all that stuff. He's still eager. He is still not ashamed to share the gospel. I don't know about you, but I'd like to say that I'd be as gung-ho, as fired up, as not ashamed as Paul was after going through all of that. But I, I have to tell you, I might be, might be a little shy, I might be a little gun-shy if, if I was him. I mean, because we, we get in a position where somebody tells us we might lose our job if we share Jesus. And we back down from that, don't we? That lady up in Dublin, off the cuff, a teacher, made off the cuff remark and said that because President Obama supports abortion that he's a baby killer. That was her opinion. She made an off the cuff remark. A student heard her. Now the school has terminated her. That was just an off the cuff remark. She wasn't teaching that. And she's lost her job. Now we get all upset and worried that we might lose our job if we are talking about our faith in any way, shape, or form. Not that we're pushing it on people, but that's what we believe and we have no problem saying it. What if we were presented with this? What if people were ready to stone us for selling, sharing the gospel? Boy, would we really face some persecution then? Would we be willing to stand up in the same way that some of us are? It's just some things to consider. The first time we walk around, if I've been through that, the first thing, the time I proclaim Jesus, oh, please no, don't throw a rock at me. I mean, Paul almost died multiple times. But God still had a purpose for Paul, and that's why he lived on. This is a committed man of God. Wednesday night, I was working with our youth talking about how to share our faith. And I think they began to realize that it's not quite as easy as you might think. Is it teenagers? Jacob's not looking at me. <laughs> gotcha. <No. laughs> 
I'll say it again. I'm not trying to embarrass it, but y'all, y'all back me up here. We were talking about how to share our faith on Wednesday. It's not as easy as you might think, is it? You had to know what you were talking about. When you got caught off guard and they asked you a question, well, I just believe what the Bible says. Well, sometimes that's not a good enough answer for an unbeliever. You need to be able to say, let me tell you what the Bible says. I might not can tell you exactly what the verse is, but I'm going to tell you what Paul said when he wrote this to the Romans or this to the Corinthians. You've got to know what you're talking about. And then, you are a better tool for God to use. We don't save anybody, do we? I can't save nobody. Can you save anybody? No. God saves folks through us. We're a tool that He used. I want to be the best tool that I can possibly be for Him to use. I want to have so much Scripture in my mind and in my heart that when I do share with somebody and the Holy Spirit's trying to work through me, He doesn't have to work very hard, does He? We need to be that kind of useful tool that the, the Lord can use. When I ask about the kind of things that discourage us from sharing our faith, those reasons really aren't that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, are they? My friends don't want to talk about that kind of thing. My friends or my family might think I'm crazy. My friends might not like me anymore. Oh no, I'll never find any more friends, will I? What are those things compared to what Paul went through anyway? I mean, they're not much of nothing, are they? I told the teenagers Wednesday that we have to be concerned about the souls of our neighbors and our family and our friends. We need to be concerned about those things. We can't be, to, be afraid to ask a person, why is it such a hard question? And I'm guilty of it myself, but why is it such a hard question to say, hey, are, are you saved? Not do you go to church. Not where do you go? To, that's an easy question. The, the, the hard question is, hey, are, are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Well, I'll, 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 I'll take that as a no. Why is that such a hard question to ask? I told them, you know, teenagers today, they'll stand around and they'll talk about the dirtiest stuff you've ever heard in your life. They'll use the dirtiest language. They'll tell you about what they did this past late weekend. They'll go on and on and on about it, about how proud they are of it. But if you ask them, are they saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? I think we're getting a little personal here. <laughs> really? It's not just teenagers. I know a lot of adults that fall in that category too. Amen? Why is that a difficult question? You know why it's a difficult question? Not because it's too personal, but because it convicts them. That question asks a simple discernment from you. Are you on the side of holiness and righteousness and God and Jesus Christ or are you not? Are you saved or are you not saved? Not are you a good person, not are you a bad person. Because if we use God's standard of holiness, we're all bad. <clears throat> But through Jesus Christ, that's where the line is drawn. You're either saved or you're not. That's why they don't like that question. That's too personal. I think we're getting a little personal here. Let me go back to telling you how drunk I got this weekend. No, no, no. We don't like that type of question. But you know something? If you ask that question, what's the worst thing they can say? I don't believe in that mess. Okay, well then let me tell you about Jesus. I don't want to listen to you. Okay, hey, I will if you want me to. I'll go all into detail and tell you, but brother, I love you and I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to go to heaven with me forever. That's what I want. And if they reject you, they reject you, but they're not really rejecting you, they're rejecting God. But what's the other side of it? Maybe you don't know this about a friend. Maybe they say, yeah, I'm saying, I love Jesus. I I love studying this word. I go to such and such a church. You know what? When you reach that point with a friend, can you think of how much meaningful your relationship is now that you know you're a brother and sister in, or brother, brother, sister, sister in Christ? Think about the, the conversations you can have from then on talking about 
God and His Word. It goes to a whole other level, doesn't it? We, need, we can't be afraid of that question, folks. We need to be concerned about the souls around us. Not just assuming a person isn't saved. We shouldn't make assumptions about anybody. Some of the nicest people I know are not, to my knowledge, Christians. But being nice doesn't get you there, does it? We can't, can't make assumptions. And we can't be concerned about minuscule, dumb little issues not, like not being liked. They didn't like Jesus very much either, did they? What if Jesus had been concerned about being liked and not liked? He'd have never made it to Calvary. He wouldn't have. Are you willing, my friends, are you willing to allow a friend or a family member to die and spend an eternity in hell just because you thought they might mock you if you share the gospel with them? Are you willing to do that? Now, none of us can save anybody, but what if your testimony, what if your testimony, if your action in witnessing to that person was that thing that tickled their curiosity, that got them interested in God, that got them interested in the gospel, that made them seek, and eventually they do get saved. What if you planted the seed? Would you be willing to keep that seed to yourself? So many of us do. Friends, we can't stay silent. We can't not share the gospel. We have to do so in a loving way, boldly and loudly. We have to share the gospel. We cannot keep it to ourselves. Have you ever heard of moderation in all things? That's simply not biblical. God doesn't want your moderation. He wants you to be all in for Him. Amen. He doesn't want your moderation. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, He says your lukewarmness, your moderation makes me sick and I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Amen. I don't want it. I have no use for it. We cannot be ashamed just as Paul was not ashamed. In verse 16, he then goes on to say, For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. What is the power of God? It is the power of God to salvation, to save us. For who? Everyone who believes, everyone who confesses Jesus Christ and lives from, for Him can be saved. Everyone. Everyone includes you. It includes your neighbor. It includes the God that you don't like. It includes the man that cut you off in the parking lot at Harvey's. God can save everyone. If He can save me, I guarantee He can save you. Amen. He then says, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Jews are the chosen people of God and they come first. But also think about this, and I told you to remember this. Paul was a Jew. Paul could relate to Jews. To the Jews that had become Christians, they didn't see themselves as no longer Jews. They saw themselves as the Jews in the Jewish faith who the Savior had been promised in the Old Testament and it had just been completed, a completed prophecy. They didn't see themselves as anything different from a Jewish person. They saw themselves as members of a religion who had been to the point where God had met His promise to them and giving them a Savior. He was able to minister to the Jews who did not believe. He was very good at it. And that was one of those gifts that God had given him. Now, what was our second point? Sharing our faith. Sharing our faith. Now, we have talked about why it's important to share our faith unashamedly, but let's talk about the process itself and what makes it effective. Let's look at the first part of verse 17 real quick. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. First of all, righteousness of God is better translated from God. Righteousness from God. And I'll tell you why. 
You might be wondering, Vic, what's the matter? Well, I'm glad you asked. God is righteous. God is holy. God is perfect. Never changing. We are not righteous. In contradistinction, we are not at all. We're naturally evil, born that way since Adam. God imputes His righteousness on us from Himself when we are saved. We get our righteousness from Him. That's why it's better translated not of God, from God. We get His righteousness put upon us. And then when we go to heaven and we're standing before God and He looks at us and He's thinking, how, how, how do you get into heaven? What's your way? Jesus is the defense attorney. And He steps in front of us and He says, here I am, Father. You see these, these pierced hands? This pierced brow, this pierced side, these pierced legs? That's how He gets into heaven. God doesn't see your unrighteousness. He sees His righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. When you stand before Him. He sees us for what Jesus is and what Jesus did on Calvary. That's why it's better translated from God. The last part of that verse says that that righteousness is revealed how? From faith to faith. The best way for you to witness to another human being about the power of Jesus Christ is to show it in your own life. That's the best way. If your faith is real and you work for Him and it is evident in the way in which you live your life, they will see it in you. The Bible says that we will be known by our fruits. Do you have good fruits or do you have bad fruits? Be a usable follower. Don't just be a lackluster, I'm here. Okay, I'm present and accounted for. There's a lady, I tell her good morning every day at work. She says, I say, how you doing? Or she'll say, how you doing to me? I'll say, I'm blessed. I'll say, how you doing? She says, I'm present and accounted for. Okay. Let's not be that Christian. Let's not be president accounted for. Let's be on fire. Let's be on fire. Now, there are those that tell you that a person, after their witness to coming to God, is all the work of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to tell you something. As far as Holy Spirit using your testimony, I'm going to tell you this, Satan can use your testimony too. If you're an, a blatant hypocrite in everything you do, don't you think Satan can't use it to discourage a person from turning their life over to Christ? Satan can do that. You whisper in the back of their ear as you're witnessing to them, don't listen to them. Do you have any idea how many times they've run around in their life? Why would you listen to them? Satan can use it too. Don't do anything to cloud a person's view when they want to tr truly see what Jesus has done in you. So what was number two? Sharing the gospel. What was number three? And we'll be done. Salvation by faith alone. Salvation by faith alone. Verse 17 says in its entirety, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now the just shall live by faith is a reference to the Old Testament. And Paul clearly knew the Old Testament when he quotes it here. The great reformer Martin Luther was touched by those words. It sparked the Protestant Reformation whereby the church was split in two as people began leaving the Catholic Church in droves. We are a product of that Reformation. Had it not been for the work of Martin Luther and godly men like that, we would not be Baptists today. We would be praying to saints. We would be praying to Mary. We would be confessing to a preacher instead of thinking we have a direct line to God. That's where we would be today. I've got lots of Catholics in my family. I've got lots of Catholic friends. I love them dearly. But the reason I'm not at a Catholic church is because I think their theology is deficient. Amen. And that's okay. 
The reason I'm not at several churches up the road is I think their theology is deficient. That's okay, because you know what? They think mine's deficient too. But, on this one, the Catholic Church itself figured out that this one was deficient. The church had come become corrupt. They were stealing money, literally, off the backs of hardworking men and women. They were telling their parishioners that not only did they have to work their way to heaven, but they could buy their way to heaven as well. They were selling what were called indulgences. That's a historical fact. They were selling indulgences. That is literally payment for the remission of sins. They said, hey, if you pay this much money to our coffers here in the church, God will forgive you of your sins. Can you think of anything more heretical than that? You know what? If, if you put money in this thing this morning, and you think that you put that money in there, got you forgiven of your sins, please tell me how much you gave and I'll give it back to you. Because this did not pay for your sins. Jesus Christ is the only thing that pays for your sin. And that is what the Catholic Church was doing. They were selling forgiveness. It's not for sale. With Jesus Christ's blood, it's bought and paid for. Martin Luther himself was a Catholic priest. He was a professor in Wittenberg, Germany. He said, this is wrong. The Bible says nothing of this. It says nothing of works getting you into heaven. It says nothing of money getting you into heaven. He read this verse, Romans 1.17, again and again and again. And he said it was like the clouds parted and it opened and it hit him like a ton of bricks. It's faith that gets you into heaven. We receive salvation and forgiveness of sin only by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And when they questioned Luther, they asked him, they said, these things that you dismiss, works, money, you dismiss these things, with, what do you replace them with? He said, Christ. Jesus Christ, man only needs Jesus Christ. Thank God for godly men who have stood up for the true message of the Bible. You see, when you witness to a person and they say they're going to make it to heaven on the basis of the fact that they've been a pretty good guy, pretty good gal, the Bible says that isn't enough. The, the just, it says, shall live by faith. In other words, since our righteousness comes from God, we are made just and righteous through our faith in Him. Mark 16, 16 says it more clearly. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But, but, there's a big but there. He who does not believe will be condemned. It draws a line, doesn't it? It doesn't matter how good you are, how nice you are, how much money you put in that offering plate, how much you give to charity, how many times you shake the pastor's hand. It doesn't matter. If you don't believe in what Jesus Christ said about Himself and what He did for you on that cross and you haven't turned your life over to Him, you will not be saved. Jesus is the only way, my friends. So let me ask you, as I've asked you so many times because I can't see into your heart from up here, I can only see your face. Have you made that commitment? Are you depending on Jesus to save you or are you dependent on you? Are you dependent on the world? Are you dependent on Oprah? I don't care who you're dependent on. If it's not Jesus, it's not going to work. If it isn't all in Jesus, it's in nothing at all. Let's pray. Most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word this morning. As we go into... A quick invitation this morning. I pray that you would just um, bless us and, and, and pull us forward for your glory. And as we go into the Lord's Supper following that, I pray that you would just bless what we're about to do. That you would cleanse us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.